Hey, traders, this is Blake Marl with Trader Summit, and I have Mr. Jim Welsh from Macro Tides with us. It's Friday. It, the markets are absolutely bananas. Uh, yeah. Currencies are moving crazy. Stocks, we have the S&P below 3,700. And my goodness, Jim, the bond market has gone to the toilet alongside stocks. I know this is not an uncommon thing that we've seen all of 2022, yeah. but boy, how are those portfolios looking uh, that are at the, that have a nice uh, nice percentage split going on with the risk with money managers right now? Huh? Yeah, the traditional 60-40 is like a deep six. You know, Dude, I mean, I, it was bonds and stocks down over 20%. Uh, and, and this is something, honestly, I worried about in June of, uh, I think it was last year, or maybe June of 2020, yeah. that we were about to see the correlation of bonds and stocks revert to what it had been for decades and decades. Most advisors, their experience goes back 20 years. Yeah, the last 20 years in 2001 and 2, 2008, bonds went up. My perspective was that that was likely to change and revert. And obviously the 60-40 results, um, you know, show that they, they have done it with a vengeance. Yeah. So, And that's not what people, even though you talked about it, it's obviously not what the market was expecting. Right. So again, we've, we've talked about this for maybe ad nauseum. Yeah. That if you've been in the business 25, 30 years, you still have never directly experienced inflation like this. And if you look at the core PCE since late, you know, like 2000, last 20 plus years, it was always right around 2% or below, which meant that anytime trouble showed up, the Fed could come to the rescue by cutting rates, doing QE, and so forth. With inflation, you know, the PCE is up, I think, I don't know, four to six percent, depending on which one you look at. You know, they just don't have that uh, flexibility. Yeah. So it's a different world. And I think the Fed meeting, the dot plot really drove home the point that really Wall Street has just not want, you know, wanted to listen that this is different. The Fed is going to hike Fed funds rate to a restrictive level and then hold it there for an extended period of time. And maybe the key thing that I think people caught <laughs> was that uh, the Fed is willing to risk having a recession to accomplish their goal of bringing inflation down. I'm sorry, what, what did you say? I th I'm, I'm just gonna buy some <laughs> stocks. But you're absolutely right. The market hears what they wanna hear. You know, and not I was so much wondering, what, not, is he not listening so to an airplane come yeah. down on his house or what? <laughs> and you I know. guess in a way, yes, that's what's happening. Fed policy is coming down on your house and everybody houses. All right, well, so, um, yeah. let's jump. You, you know, you brought, yeah. a, you brought us a big chart pack today. So let's, yeah. let's talk let's about dive. some of the things. Yeah, I mean, we had obviously a, a, a massive amount of, uh, I mean, how many central banks met this week? I want, I want to say near 10 I, I, yeah. that I can think of yeah. off the top of my head. Yeah, so. and everybody's in the hiking brigade. Uh, so again, the risk of a global meaningful slowdown uh, has obviously ratcheted up in recent weeks. Uh, you know, in my opinion, there's going to be a recession in the U.S. next year. I've been saying this for months and you know what's happening now just confirms it. My point in terms of, well, okay, here's the dot plots. And so the Fed, you know, if you look at the GDP numbers, six months ago, the Fed thought the GDP for 2022 was going to be 2.8%. Now it's down to 0.2%. More importantly, the Fed funds rate back in March, they said, okay, it'll peak, uh, you know, this year at 1.9. Now we're at 4.4. So the whole point I'm trying to make uh, Blake, is that, you know, people have been doubting the Fed, and now they're following through. And now I think people truly believe that, oh, my goodness, the Fed is actually going to raise the funds rate to 4.4, early next year, 4.6. My point is, the Fed has had a terrible track record of forecasting. And, you know, unemployment, GDP, they, you know, that's pretty much out of the control, but the Fed funds rate is under the control. So the next chart shows yeah. David, David Rosenberg went back and analyzed all the Fed's dot plots and their projections and everything. Uh, and what you can see is the Fed funds rate is the highest percentage. It's like at 37%. So they're right even about the Fed funds rate only one third of the time. And this year's track record kind of shows just how badly they can be off. So my point is, I believe Powell and the FOMC in aggregate 
took advantage of where Fed funds futures were. They were already above four and a half percent. So the Fed said, okay, you think we're going to four and a half? Yeah, we're going to confirm it. Um, and I think they took advantage of this opportunity to really deliver the message that A, they're serious about bringing inflation down and they're willing to risk a recession. But my point is, I don't think we're going to see 4.6% on the FOMC, the, the uh, Fed funds rate. So why, why why don't you why don't you say that? Because that's what the the, the t- t- terminal rate is that everybody's looking for. Yeah. Why why not? Why, why well I think the Fed was somewhat pushed to become this aggressive in terms of their numbers yeah. because of the CPI report, what happened with the core and so forth. So they they're trying to win back the credibility they lost last year, and this created a, a window of opportunity. And I think that's what the Fed has done. They're looking at the CPI and so forth. As you and I have talked, and maybe we showed it last week, by March of next year, the CPI is going to likely be under 5%. So we're about to see in the next six, seven months, a fairly, you know, I think significant unwind of inflationary pressures. So what the Fed needs in order to deviate from their forecast, Blake, is wiggle room without losing credibility. So if I'm right uh, and inflation starts to unwind, um, the September year over year number is 41 bips. So if the inflation rate for the month of September is only up 0.2, the CPI is going to drop by 20 basis points. Uh, in uh, November, or pardon me, October, I think it's 84 bips. So my point is we get into November and December, uh, you're going to see the CPI come down, I think, three quarters of a point, maybe more. So it will be comfortably under 8%. So in terms of the November meeting, don't know if the, the data is going to help them enough. They may have to go another 75 in November because that's like November 2nd, I believe they meet. And the CPI data doesn't come out until mid, uh, uh, mid-month. So I just think that the Fed, again, would prefer not to go into recession, um, but they need the data to start to support them. In the CPI report that came out, a week and a half ago, obviously, uh, did just the opposite. So I, I just think that the markets, which were not listening, as you graphically showed so well, um, you know, and now are like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. And again, the probability of recession in next year was always pretty high. And I just think the market is finally coming to terms with that. All right. Well, um, let's let's translate it into, into uh, yep. the bond market and, and other something. markets as well, because uh, and now, Jim, I, I'd like to believe you're right all the time, but I know you're not, as no one is. Um, you, you've been, you've been, you've been pretty constructive on Treasuries, thinking that they were going to go higher, but uh, lo- you know they are breaking down. We are seeing yields go yeah. up. So, what are you thinking here? I, I think based on the chart pattern uh, that we're in wave five. Okay. My uh, advice in Monday's weekly technical review was to buy TLT under 106 and take a one third position. Uh, I'm likely to add to that position early next week. I think at a minimum, we will see uh, treasury yields come down because the economy is gonna show more signs of slowing. And when inflation starts to get in gear to the downside, it's gonna be supportive of bond yields coming down. I think TLT has the potential to rally back up towards 120. That's wave four of lesser degree. Short term from the high in early August, And, you know, again, in August 2nd, I said, it's time to sell uh, TLT, which that turned out to be okay. Uh, To me, you can count one, two, three. So we're in wave five down. And now we can see that we're in wave five of wave five from the high in March of 2020. Okay. So I think this is a place to become more aggressive in buying treasury bonds and, and, and do it through TLT. Okay. Well, all right. So I'm, I, I hear you with bonds. So how about the S and P? So what are you thinking here? Because okay. we are getting scary close to our 2022 lows. Yep. Um, can we go lower? Absolutely. You know, and this, again, I've been writing about that. These are some Fibonacci re- retracement levels from the low of 2192 to the high of 4818. Uh, the 382 was 3815 in April where it says WTR. I said, it's time to sell here because the risk is we're going to 3850 because the Fed, I thought, was going to follow through in terms of expeditiously raising the funds rate uh, to two and a half percent. 
the rally to 43.25, um, I think is a bounce, obviously within a downtrend. And the S&P effectively fell just shy of 1,200 points from 40.18 to 36.37. You subtract about 1,200 points from 4,300, you're under 3,200. So to me, 35.05 is very likely and a drop to 3,200 becomes increasingly likely as it appears that we're going into a recession. Earnings still have not been uh, reduced for next year, Blake. Yeah. So if they go down, you know, they're at 240, they drop to 220 and you start doing multiples on that. 15 times 220 is what, 3,100? You know, yeah. so I think the street in the, the world kind of has like, wow, this is a wake up call. And what we're seeing in the foreign currency markets you know, this is a kind of a historic window of time. And uh, if we go to the next chart on the S&P, uh, oh, pardon me. This is what I said in this week's weekly technical review. Got it. That some of the biggest declines have happened when the market would have already oversold. And I went through in terms of, yeah, I think we could get a bounce because I thought Powell would say at some point in time, the rate of increases in the funds rate will be moderate. He did say that. But the dot plots and the overall messaging totally overwhelmed that. Uh, but this is what I said on, on Monday. So this is not a complete surprise at all uh, to anybody who's been reading my stuff. The next so, chart shows, yep. There's a breath. Yes. So okay. I think, you know, from the 4325, you know, wave one down, two, and now we're in wave. Oh, okay, market breath, sorry. So my only point in showing this, this is through yesterday, breath is even weaker today. But when you get this low and the red arrow show other times this year, when the breath, this is the 21 day net average of advances minus declines. So when it gets this oversold, A, you're gonna get a bounce. But what this shows is after each of those red arrows, yep, you got a bounce and then you went to a lower low, um, both in May, uh, last uh, J January, February, and where we are today. So is there a bounce likely at some point in time? Yes, but the odds are that bounce is gonna be, you know, uh, prove temporary. And we're likely then to see a lower low after any bounce. So, you know, and the reason this is getting so oversold, Blake, is that the intensity of the selling pressure has broadened out. It's like a wake up call. Oh my God, the Fed actually means this. You know, they are going to raise funds rate. They're going to hold it and they're willing to risk a recession. And, yeah. you know, up until now. And, and, and I know you've been, I mean, you've been saying that forever. The market's just starting to come around to that realization, right? I think so. And it's kind of like the, the wave of recognition. That's what yeah. wave threes are, whether they're the upside or downside, that whatever people, whatever belief they have, whether it be G negative or somewhat positive, Re the wave three uh, recognition portion of a decline or advance is when the light bulb goes on and you see a very, very big, intense move. And I think that's where we're at. All right. And uh, now you you have, now this is uh, the S&P matched up with the VIX. What, yep. what, are you, what are you doing with this? Well, basically look at the green line, first of all, just in the last four to six weeks. Yeah. For what, as the S&Ps, it just won't get above that green line. Now today, when I did this chart about a half hour or so ago, it was above that green line. And then just looking at prior oh. peaks with the black line. So to me, this all fits into a wave three type of decline where finally recognition, uh, the VIX is going to go and hopefully it goes above 35. Because that's, again, that flush that people finally toss in the towel that, oh, my God, we are going to probably have a recession. What that means for earnings, that recognition, I think, is developing. So uh, it could get pretty intense in the next handful of days. Oh, well, yeah, they, maybe you, a, you know, I'm, you know bonds, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and just hit yeah. stop record now and, uh, and, and <laughs> pack it in for the weekend. I'm yeah, I think I'm done with this, but no, I know you want to show us the dollar. So here we got the dollar yeah. and you know, um, it's ironic. You sent, you sent this out. I actually just tweeted a very similar chart. Me personally, because obviously yeah. I follow the dollar very closely. This yeah. is actually a channel, but you, you, you're, you're just showing the upper resistance level. Um, yeah. yeah so yeah, the, what, what do you, what do you make? The line starts in here? 2008. 
Okay, yeah. that's that high than 2017. Yep. So what you can see is in 2008, uh, well, that starting point, but in 2000, I think 15, 17, yeah, we got a little bit above that line and we're obviously above it right now. So to me, the first sign that a top is forming will be getting back under that line. Number two, which is the next chart, which we've talked about, uh, and the RSI obviously is really overbought. So it, it, it suggests that, yeah, we may have a pullback, but the world, uh, you know, the, the high may not, the high high may not be in. So you get a pullback and then ultimately maybe another push up. The next chart is a shorter term. And as you know, of the dollar, um, I've, uh, you know, talked about the five and 13 day exponential moving averages as kind of a confirmation when you've seen a bottom or top. And what we can see is since early August, the five and 13 have remained positive. In other words, the five is above the 13. And until we see the red five-day average cross below the 13-day, the, the trend is up. So, uh, so we need to see it, the dollar drop below 112, 111.80, I think was the high last week. Um, and then ultimately the five and 13-day moving averages cross to give us more confirmation. It just hasn't happened. Both, you know, the news of the yen intervention and obviously the overnight news regarding what Great Britain is doing, which wound up weakening uh, the pound. Um, you know, these are news things. It, it just, but the point I would make, and I think we talked about this maybe a little bit last week, the stronger dollar is exporting inflation all over the world. So anybody yeah. who buys oil, buys food, you're paying, if your currency is down 10%, you're paying whatever the market price is plus 10% because you got to convert from your currency into dollars to make those purchases. So um, this is getting, I think, close to almost a breaking point. At least that's what it looks like but, to me. But it, as a breaking point, what's that going to look like? Is it a break that the, the dollar needs to pull back or is it a break where other markets start breaking? That's the question. That's a million dollar question, isn't yeah. it, Jim? Yeah, yeah, it is. And right. um, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Right now, what we're seeing is the pressure to the upside. So uh, whether there'll be comments from the Treasury Department, you know, Janet Yellen saying something about the dollar being too strong or something like that. Again, I think the Fed desperately does not want to have to switch monetary policy. Um, it'd be better coming from the Treasury Department a comment like, gee, the dollar is a little bit stronger relative to its, you know, it's just something to throw some cold water on this. Um, we'll see if that happens. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, let's Last take a look gold. at gold because, uh, you know, I thought, I thought this breakdown below gold or below 1700 was going to be it. I was waiting for 1700 to be broken back above to get aggressively yep. long. That didn't happen. Um, and, and obviously, as the dollar continues to strengthen, gold slumps. But uh, how far do we go? Well, I think you get much below 1620, and the idea of a rebound uh, begins to fade. Or, yeah, you get a snapback rally that gets back towards the 1720, 1730 area. Um, uh, so I, I think, again, that 5- and 13-day moving average, again, you can see when markets start to get trendy, um, it's really a nice methodology to use to at least keep some kind of a position on. So if you were short, this is saying, okay, don't take all the position off yet. I still think there's the potential, Blake, that we'll see a gold hold here. But you're right. The dollar has to stop spiking higher. And the other risk is when markets start to fall apart, people sell whatever they can. In other words, you have a liquidity problem that starts to infect not just maybe the initial market, but it spreads out. And we're starting to see that, I think, happen. Obviously, in the currency markets, I think there's signs of it spilling over in gold, obviously equities. Um, so the next two, three days are going to be pretty critical. All right. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I watch, I'm watching gold, and I thought the breakdown would be a little bit more aggressive than it has been. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't. Ex, ex, extend that those losses yeah. in, the, in the future, right? That's right. You know, yeah. so uh, last week we talked about uh, taking out the support and it's like, okay, time to be out of gold. Um, I did put a very small position on the other day 
um, which actually was profitable until this morning. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, so I'm looking to add, but I'm waiting because there's a risk that everything kind of goes through a puke phase. Yeah. And uh, ironically, that probably would be supportive of TLT and treasury yields coming down. Yeah. All right. Well, um, well, Jim, I want to I want to thank you for spending your time with us. And and, and thanks for updating your your traders that, that that, you know, I know you send out your newsletter, but even yep. even like give people updates in between newsletters, like what you, you pointed out earlier yep. today. And I think that's really valuable. So how do people learn more about what you do? Macrotides.com. Uh, and if you'd like a sample letter, Jim Welsh, macro at Gmail. Thanks, Jim. You know, I always appreciate our talks on Friday. You help and when, when the days that our heads have to be on a swivel, uh, you help, <laughs> help me keep it kind of straight. So I, I do yeah. appreciate that. And, I, and I'm sure other traders here do too. So if you like what you hear from Jim, give him a big thumbs up on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of this exclusive content every Friday. Jim, have a great weekend and I'll talk to you next week. You got it. Thanks, Blake. Hey, traders, Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, click the bell notification so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.